Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Rita Roy, CEO of the National Spine Health Foundation. Welcome to Spine Talks, where we bring unparalleled access to world-class experts. I'm here at the International Spinal Deformity Symposium, and it is my honor to be joined today by Dr. Larry Lenke and his patient, Ms. Pat Shellhorn. We're here today to talk about Pat's spine health journey, her remarkable story of healing and recovery. We call Pat a spinal champion because ultimately she was able to find spinal treatment that got her back to her life and to the people and activities that she loves. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Lenke now, and he's going to start our conversation with his patient, Pat. Thanks, Rita. Appreciate it. I'm very um, happy to be part of this conversation. Uh, especially to highlight uh, Pat and her, and her journey. She's a very special patient, and I think as you'll see by, during this conversation, has really developed a, a special um, type of uh, a grit and, uh, uh, and I think uh, perseverance to get to where she is today. Uh, and again, rather than me kind of explaining uh, 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 her story, I'm going to kind of ask, uh, ask you, Pat, to kind of w how your spine history started as far as when you started first having issues with your spine and kind of uh, what, how that led up to basically being here today, four years past a very significant surgery as we'll ultimately discuss. So Dr. Lenke, we're looking here at Pat's x-rays, and on the left is her pre-op x-ray. We can see that big, big curve in her spine. It's causing her shoulders to be uneven. It almost looks like her rib cage is leaning on her hip bone. And on the right is the post-op x-ray. We can see her spine is straight, her shoulders are even, and all of that hardware in there is the result of a very big, very, very successful operation you performed on Pat. And here we see the x-rays again, the pre-op on the left and the post-op on the right. Uh, this is Pat standing up. You can see pre-op. She had a very, very big curve in that spine. And, and then she's straightened um, after the big operation. You know, let's go back to the beginning and kind of chronologically understand your, your journey from, from your, your perspective. Okay. So I was first diagnosed with scoliosis at the age of 16. I had an 18 degree curve. Uh, I was given exercises to do. And many of them were core strengthening. And at the time, I was also a gymnast mm -hmm. and I was a gymnast through my third year of college. So I was doing a lot of the things that would keep me in, in a better way with my spine. I'm not sure about the rest of my body, but with my spine, it definitely was, um, I was doing those type of exercises. In 40 years, I had only progressed from 18 to, I think, 42 degrees. So that's it's so a little bit lower than average, yeah, but, but unfortunately, uh, it's still progressive, and that's, right. that's the key, right. is that even a 40-degree curve often isn't considered something that needs surgery, but right. obviously it's the concern is the progression over time, and right. often accelerates as, as we age, unfortunately. Our spines have natural curves that exist for a reason, so right. if you're looking at the front of somebody, you actually can't see those curves, because they're going in 3D, right? And so those, we call those curves that align, that make up your spine. So it's about that alignment. But Dr. Linke, right. as a specialist in... So basically, the, the way to think about this is that the spine, as viewed from the front, should basically be straight. Uh, your head should be centered over your pelvis, and there should be no curvature or deviation of your spine in what's called the frontal plane, looking from the front of the, of the body. But from the side, is, uh, as Rita says, we do have sagittal shapes and curves of the spine from the skull and head all the way to the pelvis that keep our basically head centered over the pelvis. And uh, a cervical lordosis or a kind of sway back, sway, sway neck is what we call it, and a, a thoracic kyphosis going the other way, and then a lumbar lordosis. And those three reciprocal curves keep again, our head centered over our pelvis and allow us to function and, and, uh, and mobility, especially in our neck and our lower back is where most of the mobility occurs. So, right, uh, we do have normal shapes and curves, but uh, the key is from the front, there shouldn't be any 
any curve. And uh, uh, so by the, the definition of scoliosis, that's a, a curvature that's occurring from the frontal plane. And that, that's abnormal. Uh, anything over 10 degrees of, of curvature is considered abnormal and true scoliosis. And obviously, then we're talking about progressive curvature, progressive deviation of the spine from the center. And that's obviously when sometimes things get more problematic. It sounds like the ultimate. Right. I, when, when I was diagnosed with the 18 degree curve, I was diagnosed not because I went to have my spine diagnosed, but I had lifted something, a piece of sheetrock with my dad. I had pain in my back. I had some shortness of breath. And my mom took me to the orthopedist. And he said, well, she collapsed her lung. That's the first thing. But she also has scoliosis. So it was sort of by default that I got that diagnosis. Then I started the. And that's not too uncommon, actually. That's not that uncommon right. for a small curve. Is that it's what we call incidental finding of, of review for another condition is what you have. So that's actually pretty common. Right. So so I did go a long time. I was a, a gymnast. I was a physical education teacher and coach. I was a personal trainer. I, I was doing well, and then my curve went south kind of quickly. So. I went, I guess, like an 80-degree curve in about 8 to 10 weeks from where I was. So I was then not functioning the way I wanted to function. I looked like the little teapot tipping over. I was using a walker, and if I did, we had my grandson's christening, and the only way to be in the pictures without the walker was to have my husband on this side holding me up and my hand on my leg to try to keep me as straight as I could go. I had one minimally invasive surgery that didn't work well on my body and uh, had my spine collapse, essentially. I had no direction. I wasn't given, OK, now you have to do this, or you have to do this. And I went online, and you know, I tried to figure it out myself. Uh, you seemed a bit frustrated that you, know, you had to kind of try and take a hold of your health and your very overall nice. pathway to find help. Patients ultimately do better when they are more informed about their condition and their treatment options. Spine is very complicated. It's scary. When patients are out there struggling to find information, it's hard to find. It's hard to find that information. It's hard to hear from other patients who've gone through a journey. And, and that's what we're trying to do at the National Spine Health Foundation is to bring educational information to people so that people can empower themselves with knowledge to ask the right questions of their healthcare providers. So to find an expert and be knowledgeable enough to ask the right questions. And Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that we're going to hear Pat telling us about today is that, you know, you lived 40 years of your life, 18 degree to 40 degree, that was pretty stable. But then as Dr. Lenke points out, you know, our yes. spines degenerate with time, naturally, anyhow. Um, but for you, things really radically changed. And what do you do when that happens, right? If you don't do your due diligence and you just say, I'll live with it, or I'm afraid of it, or whatever, there's a better life beyond where you're at. And when you find a genius a man with hands from God that can give you that better life, you're very grateful. He was so calming, and I was very nervous because of how quickly it progressed and what I was told, I may not survive a surgery, I shouldn't have it, you know, all these different opinions. But I didn't have a choice. There was no choice to be made. I had to have it, or I was going to be in a wheelchair, or... God knows what else would have happened. In the medical system, um, you go from internship to residency to fellowship, which is the most senior level of, of advanced medical or surgical training. And, and uh, normally, spine, fellow, spine fellows spend one year uh, with um, uh, surgeons kind of learning their, the craft that they're going to uh, perform the rest of their life. And obviously, you know, there's lots of surgeons uh, who, who train fellows. I've been fortunate now to train almost 130 fellows who are situated throughout the country. 
And because again, I can't do this forever, no. you know, nor do I want this uh, uh, this um, uh, um, discussion to uh, provide patience, you know, for me for me to treat every patient. I can't do that. So right. this, I, I want this to basically to be an educational uh, s session to make sure that people understand there are surgeons who can are capable of taking care of all kind of spine problems, and you right. just have to be able to find. The right the surgeon right in the in, in your part of the country or world, and uh, and and sometimes it does take some research. But again, thanks thanks to the internet, that's all possible now, and right. and, and that's again thanks to the National Spine Health Foundation and who kind of puts this all together. That's really why we're all here. And it's so essential because when I talked to Dr. Roy, I, I had said that I went online to try to find somebody like over 30 years old that had had this extensive surgery. And I couldn't find anybody. And that didn't help because then I wasn't sure. I'm almost 60. I was 59. I didn't see anybody saying, yeah, go for it, you know. <laughs> but again, when you find that person, that almost immediately puts you in a, in a zone where you know you're in the right place, you know you have trust and honesty and preparation as far as what to expect before, during, and after. I would not suggest anybody just push their scoliosis aside and, and just think they have to live like that because they don't and it does progress. And I was a very active person who became very inactive because I would fall over. I was using a walker at that point and I need I really needed to have the surgery. So I don't know if I'd be here today if it wasn't for Dr. Lanky because I know I was a very complicated case. And I had had other doctors tell me I wouldn't touch you. No, no way. And really doctors need to give you more information than that than just, you know, if anybody says surgery, run. Well, that's an elementary answer to a question I didn't really even ask you, you know, I want you to evaluate. And, you know, there are many doctors that were not even willing to evaluate me for the surgery, which is so important to have a, a rapport that you're comfortable speaking to your doctor and he's comfortable speaking with you. He doesn't talk down to you. He doesn't minimize what you're experiencing. It's just essential that you have that trust. And... I think this is what will bring not just patients but doctors to the understanding that there's help out there, but it's not out there enough. Especially surgeons now are becoming almost too subspecialized. I'm sure you saw other very fine spine surgeons who are very good at what they do, but there's really you know seven, eight, nine different types of spine surgical subspecialists now. I happen to subspecialize in very complex spinal deformities. But again, I think it still behooves uh, us, and, and the surgeons you saw, spinal surgeons you saw, certainly knew your condition was challenging. I, I mean, we give them credit for not attempting to treat you if they're not comfortable Absolutely. with that, right? But at the same time, I really think, uh, and I'm talking, speaking out to my uh, colleagues, that you know you have to, uh, if you cannot take care of the patient, try and find someone who can. This is very easy to do, or at least give the patient some direction on how to find the right person, right? Um, in a minimum, we don't. And I think that's where hopefully the National Spine Health Foundation and the colleagues involved in there could that's be right. a help as well, it's right? A, it's a great goal. Yeah. It really is because I think it benefits doctors. They're not taking on something that they're right. uneasy about. Right. And it benefits patients because they have the ability to not interview, but in a sense, interview other doctors and get their take on their condition right. and what their outcome might be with the surgery. One of the doctors that I spoke with said, you'll never survive, don't ever do scoliosis surgery. And that was when I was at a 42 degree curve. He said, don't, go do PT, but don't ever do surgery. That wasn't the right answer. I mean, I literally was writing letters the night before my surgery and I had all the faith in the world in him, but I thought if my Addison's kicked in or something, you don't know. Doctors are not gods, you know. They, they do their very finest work. Everybody is human. And I think that's where the trust and the education, you educate yourself. Your surgeon should be educating you. 
And Dr. Lanky was very good at that, very clear. I had other things in my back that were issues, and we went through it all. And he informed me that my recovery would be longer than somebody else's because of the extent and the type of the damage. But I knew when he said, I can make you straight, he had that much confidence that I was in the right place. He was going to make me straight. And I was going to play tennis again one day, and I was going to climb rock walls one day and, and, and do the things I always love to do. Doctors and patients forget that your goal is to get to a place of functioning in a life that you're happy with and not in a place where now you have this you know, burden you're carrying with you. It shouldn't be that. It should be progression to a good place. Quality of life, right? Well, quality about of that, right? life. And returning to activities that you love doing. We're not going to make you 20 again, right. but no, you're going to be no. the best 59-year-old version of yourself yes, that you can be, absolutely. right? And, and be able to do that. Okay. I, I want to underscore, um, Pat, your story about um, d getting opinions and finding the right doctor in my own experience. And I think there's a lot of fear out there about surgery. And, um, you know, surgery is not the right thing for everybody, but for some people it is absolutely the right thing. And I had a spine surgeon who told me to put off my surgery as long as I could. And if you tell a woman who's had three children yeah. to put something off as long as they can and tolerate a little pain, 10 years went by. And so when it came time for me to have my surgery, I was at a point of nerve damage, and right. that was maybe not the best advice to put that off for, for that long. So I think to your point, you've got to find the right uh, information for yourself and don't put things off for too long because it can make it worse. Um, and seeing a spine surgeon doesn't always mean surgery. Right. Is that right, Dr. Lenke? Yeah, absolutely. You? Actually, uh, the vast majority of spine conditions, uh, well over 99%, do not require surgery. Um, and, 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 you know, spine-related problems, of especially the neck and the lower back, are, is the second most common malady of mankind next to viruses and colds and flus. So uh, it's so very common. But, uh, you know, once you ha start having structural, structural malalignments of your spines and nerve compressions and things like that, then, then the surgical aspect becomes more commonplace. But again, even those kind of things can often be uh, treated with, uh, with therapies or injections and non-operative treatments in the vast majority of cases, especially early on. But, but it gets back to, you know, what your problem is and what your uh, uh, quality of life is. And, and, um, and again, and, and uh, the knowledge you're getting to kind of make informed decisions uh, on, on what you want to do, right? And that ultimately comes down, as you mentioned earlier, to your own decision process, right? I mean, you have to, we're all right. in charge of our own uh, ultimate outcome. Ultimately, right. we, we make the decisions about what surgeon is going to go into your spine. It's understandable that it's fearful, but what's more fearful is what will happen if you don't do it and how your quality of life will deteriorate. Yeah, and that's one thing I always tell patients is that unfortunately many spine problems are, are dynamic and they're progressively worsened. They're not static in other words. Right. And that's, patients have to understand that, is that you're looking at points in time and obviously how your quality of life is, is diminishing, deteriorating dynamically. And so I have patients kind of uh, go back, how was your quality of life five years ago? two years ago, a year ago, and now, and that's kind of the slope you're on, because everyone's on a different slope. Yes. Some people deteriorate very slowly, or, uh, and there's other things going on in their life. Uh, some people deteriorate very quickly, as you did. I mean, you, you really kind of fell off the cliff. And, I did. And, and, that's, and that, that's understandable. That happens. So we have to understand, everyone has to be treated very individually as far as the assessment of their progression, the assessment of the deterioration in their quality of life. Uh, to help decide on exam, you know, when, when surgical intervention is, is appropriate. Right. Dr. Lenke, when you mentioned Pat's case to me and wanting to do this today, um, one of the, the highlights of, of Pat's case is just how remarkable she has done from where she was when she came to you and where she is now. I mean, the patient, ultimately, you know, you have to be very... Motivated, you have to you have to be a little bit of a, a risk taker because these are major surgeries that are, are not guaranteed to be 100 percent successful. Obviously, that, that's our goal. I mean, uh, you know, we're in a healing profession, and uh, but uh, fortunately, we're not 100 percent successful. We're having a two-day meeting to basically all learn together, surgeons who do this for a living around the world, 
uh, on how we can get better because the, these aren't 100% uh, perfect. And we also mentioned today how much the patient's own involvement, their, their motivation, uh, their um, preparation, uh, and everything like that is, is a com important component to their ultimate outcome as well. And you mentioned before, we're not giving her a 20-year-old body pad, right? right? We talked about that. We're right. not going to make you 20 again. We're going to try and make you the best 59-year-old because right. you had a condition that at age 59 with continued deterioration, your body is going to be 79. Uh, yeah. Very soon, and you know, uh, so that that's the thing that you have to understand. Uh, what, you know, when expectation. If you don't have surgery, which is all your choice, well, what's your quality of life going to be a year from now? Right. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, you're, it's going to be worse um, because right. if you draw your slope was really, really steep. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. We hear people say, "Well, spine surgery is elective surgery. It doesn't really save lives." But I say it does save lives, and it's maybe not so elective. I didn't elect to have spine surgery. I needed to fix my back, right, Pat? Right. You needed to fix your curves. And so there are lots of things that are confusing about our language around spine uh, treatment. And, and I will say, and I think you would agree with me, Pat, that we do save lives. We are improving the quality of somebody's life. As Dr. Lenke said, spine conditions, number one cause of disability in the world. The leading cause of disabling individuals to the point of reduced quality of life to, to where, you know, it, it is, you're just not participating in life. And so to me, that is saving a life. Right. If you're able to restore someone's function to having a quality of life that they can enjoy with their loved ones. And I think, Pat, that is something absolutely. that you absolutely experienced. One of the other pieces of it, when you, when you go and you have your evaluations, um, go with an open mind and listen to everything. Take notes if you need to, because you'll forget half of what you just heard if you don't have. My husband's been wonderful. He's been with me every step of the way, so what I forget, he remembers. And I, I bring that up because family support is so important. If you have people negating the fact that you really do need to have that surgery and making you feel less comfortable having it, then you need to find people that are supporting you in the right direction. Because without family support, and trust, and um, just the belief that you are doing the right thing, not going into it saying, well, this is like going to play lotto, or this is like going to, I don't gamble, but you know, it's not, it's not that situation. It's, I need to have this. I have found the best person on the planet that I could find to do it. And he accepted me as a patient, which was huge for me. And that made a world of difference because I had come to him with other doctors telling me I would be crazy to do that. And that's not what a doctor should be doing. That's not giving alternatives. That's not explaining anything. That's just saying, not me. I'm not touching you. And then you go nowhere else. Yeah, I mean, it's okay, again, as I mentioned earlier, for doctors to say or surgeons to say, right. you know, it's, this is not under my purview or, or domain, so I'm not going to recommend surgery. But to go beyond that and say you'd be crazy to have the surgery, that's right. where I kind of draw the line and say that that is a little bit inappropriate. It was. So, uh, so again, um, uh, you know, I, mean, that's, I, I hear that all the time, and it's obviously frustrating from a perspective of mine. But again, it's, I think that has to do, as I mentioned, from our super subspecialization. And again, unfortunately, uh, you know, the old adage of spine surgery, uh, especially in the distant past, had a bad reputation. Yes. And part of yes. that was that the results and outcomes were not very good. And the reason was is that spine uh, surgeons didn't specialize only in spine surgery. So basically, two groups, orthopedic surgeons or neurosurgeons, did spine surgery, but they also did other things. Especially orthopedic surgeons often did hip surgery and knee surgery and shoulder right. surgery and an occasional spine surgery. And neurosurgeons did a lot of brain surgery and occasional spine surgery. And basically now, you know, thankfully, uh, and especially in this country, in most advanced countries in the world, uh, only spine surgeons do spine surgery. And guess what? The results are better okay. because we're focusing on, only on 
you know, similar things every day, similar conditions, similar diagnosis, similar treatments every day. So the results are so much better. But uh, a lot of the um, more senior physicians who remember back in the day when spine surgery was, outcomes weren't as good. I mean, they, you know, they do remember patients, many patients who didn't do very well. And so that, that, that's kind of tarnished the reputation of spine surgery, but we're obviously we're trying to really uh, resolve that over time. And I think we're making inroads, but it, it takes time. Right, it's, it's remarkable. And, and we tell spinal champions stories at the National Spine Health Foundation. So we're telling the good news about spinal health care. There are some not good stories, but we want to tell the good stories because we want people to understand that most of the time these days, most of the time, there are good results that come out of results. Like results and, and very complicated results like Pat, less complicated uh, problems like mine, L4, L5 spondy, very easy to fix, but still major surgery for me. Um, I have a question for, for Pat and for Dr. Lenke, and that is that, you know, Pat talks so much about seeing different surgeons who gave her a different answer. What should patients do? You know, so much of the time we say, get a second opinion. If you talk to a surgeon and he says one thing, and you talk to another surgeon and she says another thing, should you get a third opinion? What should you do with differing information? How should people handle that kind of information? The bottom line is you, I think as a patient, um, need to ultimately find uh, a surgeon um, that you trust, as, as Pat mentioned. And, and if that takes three, four, five, six opinions, then that's what it takes. Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, it's really the trust between the patient and the surgeon uh, especially in spine surgery and especially in complex spine surgery, that's to make the difference between a success and failure. So it's probably worth the effort to do that. Again, uh, different in major cities like New York versus smaller areas where there's uh, you know le lesser amounts of spine surgeons to to be to see as an opinion. But um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there are certainly now, especially in the last ten years, the profession of spine surgery is is erupted with uh, just numerous uh, amounts of spine surgeons who are extremely capable of taking care of nearly every spine problem, uh, especially in any major city in this country. Um, so there's there really is no excuse to try and seek out you know someone who you're comfortable with and who you trust to have this type of surgery. That's kind of my my thought. Hopefully it's not seven, eight, nine opinions because unfortunately so, yeah. sometimes it gets on and you, and you get more frustrated because yeah. sometimes yeah. those nine uh, opinions may be all slightly different. And right. so you know, I've seen patients after yeah. having eight, nine, ten opinions and I give them a, a tenth different opinion or eleventh yeah. opinion and they're even more frustrated. Yeah. But, uh, but you've brought up such a great point today, which is that um, surgeons now in spine, that it's a, it's a dedicated field and they are subspecializing. So maybe there's a spine surgeon that specializes in disc replacement, but doesn't necessarily do scoliosis surgery. So, so again, just educating yourself enough to know to ask that question. Right. And again, and the internet certainly is help, helpful as well, and various foundations and, and um, organizations like the National Spine Health Foundation can also be very yes. much helpful. helpful. Right. Yes. And Pat, you were lucky to have a family member who was a nurse um, yes. that could help you navigate some of this information. Yes. I, I, I did my research and I said, this is who I think is the best of the best. And then she went through everything online and she said, I don't see anything wrong with him. He's got nothing, no strikes against him. And I think you're right. And I, I, going back to you're the patient and you need to take responsibility, you don't have to abide by if a doctor is giving you information that doesn't feel right to you, then there's another doctor out there that will give you the right information. Just you can't give up because when you give up on yourself, you're giving up on your future, on your quality of life, on the things that you thought you'd be doing at 70 that now you hope you make it to 70. So it's super important to establish a relationship with the person that you know you're in the right place. And it may take seven, eight, different doctors. And they may all tell you you're nuts if you do it. But I'm walking, talking proof that I was not nuts to do it. I did the right thing. I'd be in a wheelchair by now. And I'd have no quality of life. And I, I had numerous issues. In fact, when I was originally scheduled, 
um, it was September, and then they called me and they said, oh, we have to change it. I'm like, please don't change it. I just want to get it done. But um, they scheduled me on a day that Dr. Lanky did not have a 14-hour window, window in the OR. So he knew that he needed, mine was almost 13 hours, he knew that he needed a time span. Some people are four hours, some people maybe eight hours, but the surgeon has to know how, you know, he's got to have the OR for as long as he needs. But all the fact that he could explain all that, many doctors don't go into that kind of detail. You know, they'll, they'll schedule your surgery for whatever part of your body, and they come in, they mark it with a pen, they walk by you in the recovery room and say what they're going to say, and then they, they think their job is done, but that's just a piece of their job that's done. Because the recovery and getting back to functioning well is huge. And, you know, Dr. Lanky's amazing. And his team, they're all on the same page. And I, we laughed about this before, but when he did rounds, he would have like seven little fledglings following him. And you could hear a pin drop when he spoke about my case, when he examined me everything and and it was so it made me feel so good because I knew these people were getting his information and they would pass on good information one day rather than you know just yeah. you, you can't do this perfect perfect key up to give a shout out to my team you know yeah, as, as Pat knows wonderful. I have a um a preoperative team, a clinical team that works with patients kind of before and after surgery, uh, Angie and uh, yeah. Samara and, uh, and Myra uh, and others, uh, and then an inpatient team that works obviously in the OR, patient people you never even saw, the right. 20 people who helped me do the surgery that you never saw, right. the dozens of people post-operative in our Oxpine Hospital that help take care of you, that then as I say, it's, it, it's a village of people to prepare, perform, and recover patients from this type of surgery. And I'm so blessed to have such a wonderful team as you experienced. Oh, they were. So shout out. And I know I was concerned about the pain issue. And I remember Dr. Lanky saying to me, you know, don't tough it out and be in severe pain because you won't heal as well. But this educational process that you're so, uh, I'm so happy to see somebody so invested in because that's what was lacking for me uh, until I found Dr. Lanky was knowing what I needed to do, knowing that I didn't have options, and that I could survive it. Well, we're so blessed to have you sharing your story with us, Pat. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to I your never hear a story like this from, from the to total perspective either. I'm, I'm glad oh, to hear it tell you the so truth. <laughs> so and, office and, visits don't go like this, right? We talk yeah, about other things, yeah. but it's great to hear your story, honestly. Yeah, amazing. And 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 again, shouting out to your team, Dr. Lincoln. I think that's part of the, the interviewing process when you're trying to identify the right surgeon that you connect with. You know, getting a sense of the team, the team also sort of speaks for uh, the provider um, because you're going to have a relationship with, with the team. We touched a little bit on recovery. That's such an important part of the journey. My surgeon said to me, Rita, I'm going to do my part in the OR. You're going to have to do your part to get better. And we're going to give you the tools and guide your way, but you've got to do it. And Pat, you've done that. Bravo. Thank you. Talk a little bit about that. You've mentioned Cliff, who's sitting in the back of the room right. here, that you, your family supports you, friends or family, having that support structure to enable you to get to the place where you can do your exercises and do your right. recovery. Talk to us a little bit about that. So much of it is in here. You have to get to a place in your brain that says, I've been told what to do to finish the work that Dr. Lanky did. And if I don't do those things, then that's bad on me because I've just wasted his time, his expertise, and a big scar down my back for nothing when it's not that hard to follow the directions. PT initially comes to the house and goes over, no mats on the floor, no matchbox cars to trip over. <laughs> you know, I have a five-year-old grandson in that you know, is the way it goes. And, um, but the, your, your physical therapist is a very integral part of your recovery. 
So find a good one who's invested in you. You know, I knew Dr. Lanky was invested in me. I knew my family was invested in me. So I had one physical therapist who was, you know, here's the sheet of paper, here's the exercises, and I'm like, this is not hands-on physical therapy. So I found a, a physical therapist who I knew uh, was an excellent physical therapist. And at the end of every session, she massaged my scar. She massaged my back. She did everything right for me. And that's part of your recovery. But that's on you because Dr. Lanky is in Manhattan um, at the end of the expressway out east. So I had to find the perfect person who was as invested in me getting the most out of that surgery as I possibly could. And I was fortunate to have done that and um, to have, you know, a husband, so. to have a husband that will wash the pots and pans and vacuum the floor and do the laundry. And, you know, you can't lift things. I wasn't supposed to lift my grandson. That was torture. I'm curious from your perspective, obviously, after going a fairly significant spine fusion reconstruction, we're not talking, you know, one or two, we're talking nearly total spine reconstruction, but when did you, when did a kind of, you see light at the end of the tunnel uh, as far as realizing this was a good thing to do and help other prospective patients understand it or, or current patients who are, you know, just having surgery? Well, what, what was the definitive moment where you realized, you know, this, I'm glad I did what I did and I'm, I'm realizing this was a good, good well, idea? Gaining four inches in height was a good indicator that I was no longer at 80 degrees or wherever I was. I was now... He, Dr. Lanky said I can make you straight, and he said he could make me straight, so he made me straight. And even if he makes you, or uh, your surgeon gets you as close to straight as can be, that's an improvement in your quality of life down the road. And, and don't minimize any portion of this process, from interviewing your doctors and making sure that you are comfortable with them and their team. The other piece that I think is very important is empathy. Because when you go in and you know how you feel and you know what you look like and you know, you know how your dress hem goes like this and your pant legs go like this and you know, you want somebody that understands that it, it's the surgery but it's all the pieces that go into that and into in your heart, the fact that you're going to be okay, but you're responsible for a big portion of it after the fact. We, he made me straight. I mean, you weren't tipping over. I was not the little teapot anymore. She not only had a scoliosis, but she had what's called a coronal malalignment. So her head was basically centered around eight centimeters off to the side. From a uh, spine deformity surgeon perspective, actually, that's a really good diagnosis. Even if we don't completely straighten the scoliosis, if we get the head centered over the pelvis, people realize now they're straight uh, and they're, they're very appreciative. So the, the, the change or what we call delta is so great that we know patients really appreciate that early on. That's why I asked the question if you notice yes. that because patients who have not only scoliosis but a coronal, combined coronal malalignment associated with that often are uh, very appreciative very early on following yeah. surgery. And what I love about what I do is that Everything is so individualized. Uh, uh, really, I, there, there was really no one in the world having a surgery that Pat had the day she had her surgery uh, uh, like that. I mean, I mean, as far as L45 D gen spondylitis, there's probably a hundred people today having that kind of surgery in various forms. Uh, even scoliosis surgery, there's probably thousands of patients today having a scoliosis surgery. But uh, when you have a combined you know, advanced scoliosis, progressive with coronal malalignment and degeneration previous uh, minimal invasive surgery, again, her overall package was extremely unique. And that's why I love it. It's very called high quality, low quantity. I don't do many of these surgeries. You know, obviously, just one a day, but. But obviously, we have to put all our efforts into it because it's uh, they are very big surgery. So every patient's different. So every patient's expectations are going to be different. I want people to be uh, cautiously optimistic, right? right? I mean, uh, and I try and be confident but not cocky. So that's right. my approach to it. Uh, and I don't know if you found that because if you're not confident, uh, there's no way I would let someone enter my body for 13 hours if the surgeon wasn't confident they could help me. Right. But if he's that surgeon, he or she is cocky, I'm not sure that is going to make me feel 
comfortable going into surgery. So there's a fine line with that. Same thing with patient expectations. You want to obviously want someone to, that wants to get better and wants to have a better quality life and is motivated to do so. But if they, again, expect to be like they were 30 years prior without any spine disease, that's not realistic. And my team, I think, also helps us uh, manage expectations of the patient to be appropriate and, re and realistic. Patient expectations are a big part of how patients view the success or failure of their surgery uh, long term. They need to have that line of communication open because if you just take the word of, of the surgeon, they don't want you to do that. They want you to ask the questions. They want you to understand what they're going to do because it is your body, your recovery, your future. So Dr. Lenke would never have been cocky. He would never have patted himself on the back. You're four years out of this major, major spine surgery that you had. What are some of the things that you're able to do now that uh, you were afraid you wouldn't be able to do anymore? Well, there was definitely a progression. When I first got home and I was doing PT, that, that was the focus. And then I tried to figure out what I could do with my grandson. And I came up with badminton because the birdie flies slow and the racket is long. And he was maybe three. And he hit it up onto the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and so now he likes to do that, and, and I modified, I played volleyball, but now I play volleyball with a balloon with my grandson, and so y y you have to be cautious. One of the things Dr. Lanky said is, try not to fall and be careful, and th that's good advice. He didn't say, don't do anything. Right. He just said, be cautious. I tried pickleball. Pickleball. I tried Yay. to get on a bike again. You know, I'm a little nervous still, just yeah. because and it has really nothing to do with my back, just my osteoporosis more sure. than anything. I wanted to try everything. Yeah. Like at school, we started a project adventure program. Nobody else would teach it but me. I got certified. We right. did rock climbing. We did. So after the surgery, I just tried to get in touch with things that maybe I didn't do before, mm -hmm. but they were steps I could take now because I couldn't go all the way back to where I was. Because if, if you go have this surgery and you sit and you do nothing, nothing will come back to you. Right. I mean, we're in charge after the surgery. We really, we have our follow-ups, but we have to take control over that end of it. And you have to be positive. You have to seek out people that are also saying, let's, let's go for a walk. Let's try this today. Let's do this. If you don't find those people, you will be sitting on the couch or laying in bed, and yeah. you're going to miss out on the rest of your life. And I see people, there's a woman at church that is so crippled by it. And she, I tried to have a conversation with her, and I think she met up with enough resistance from other people that she had given up. And I felt horrible for her because she should not have. Pat's self-advocacy, her resilience, Amazing, her huh? determination to take it's, care it's of inspiring. herself <laughs> is so inspiring. It gives hope. It gives other people hope. That's what we're all about at the foundation. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you've shared your journey. We say the journey to spinal health, it's a journey. And you can't do it alone. You've right. got to be surrounded by good information and find experts that can help you. This is the result of, uh, of modern medicine, and I'm just so privileged to be able to help someone like her. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to you. You have no, every day I, I recognize how lucky I am that I found you. Every day. Thanks. I appreciate it. That means a lot. Thank, Thank you, you to all of you. And the more information that's shared, the more people that will be helped.